A reading from the book of the Acts of the Apostles. In Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of the Italian cohort, as it was called. <clears throat> he was a devout man who feared God with all his household. He gave alms generously to the people and prayed constantly to God. One afternoon at about three o'clock, he had a vision in which he clearly saw an angel of God coming in and saying to him, Cornelius. He stared at him in terror and said, what is it, Lord? He answered, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. Now send men to Joppa for a certain Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the seaside. When the angel who spoke to him had left, he called two of his slaves and a devout soldier from the ranks of those who served him. And after telling them everything, he sent them to Joppa. About noon the next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on the roof to pray. He became hungry and wanted something to eat. And while it was being prepared, he fell into a trance. He saw the heaven opened and something like a large sheet coming down, being lowered to the ground by its four corners. In it were all kinds of four-footed creatures and reptiles and birds of the air. <clears throat> then he heard a voice saying, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is profane or unclean. The voice said to him again a second time, what God has made clean, you must not call profane. This happened three times, and the thing was suddenly taken up to heaven. Now, while Peter was greatly puzzled about what to make of the vision that he had seen, suddenly the men sent by Cornelius appeared. They were asking for Simon's house, and they were standing by the gate. They called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was staying there. While Peter was still thinking about the vision, the spirit said to him, Look, three men are searching for you. Now get up, go down, and go with them without hesitation, for I have sent them. So Peter invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and went with them, and some of the believers from Joppa accompanied him. The following day they came to Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. Then B Peter began to speak to them. I truly understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. You know the message he sent to the people of Israel, preaching peace by Jesus Christ. He is Lord of all. That message spread throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John announced, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, how he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. We are witnesses to all that he did, both in Judea and in Jerusalem. They put him to death by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and allowed him to appear, not to all the people, but to us who were chosen by God as witnesses and who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one ordained by God as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking, the Holy Spirit fell upon all who heard the word. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles, for they heard them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter said, Can anyone withhold the water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? So he ordered them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they invited him to stay for several days. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then Jesus said to his disciples, 
The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. The Gospel of Christ. The last several months, we've been working our way through the narrative lectionary, exploring and mentally reliving the life of the people of God through the Hebrew Bible, and then walking with those who saw and heard Jesus and witnessed his death and resurrection. Now we move into the life of the early church, the time when the apostles and disciples celebrated the fact Jesus was alive and Lord of all. After the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, thousands were added to the number of believers in Jerusalem. And the followers of Jesus experienced something of a honeymoon period. They shared meals together. They generously gave to those among them who were in need. They regularly got together to worship, pray, and listen to the teachings of Jesus from those who had heard them firsthand. However, as in any group of people, tensions did develop. And this was over the distribution of charity to the widows among them. There were two kinds of believers at that time. There were those who had been born in Judea and grew up there, the Judean Jews. And then there were those that were raised outside of Judea among the Gentiles. Those were Hellenized Jews. They were called that because they spoke Greek as their primary language, not Aramaic of the Jews within Palestine. And some in the church looked down on these Hellenized Jews. And their widows were complaining that they were being left out of the distribution of daily food. The solution the apostles introduced was the selection of seven men full of the spirit who were commissioned to oversee the administrative task of the group. This left the apostles free to preach and teach, and these deacons took care of the nitty gritty kind of work. And things went smoothly until one of these seven deacons, Stephen, was brought up on charges of teaching others to disregard the law of Moses and of speaking against the temple. His trial before the religious leaders broke up into a frenzied mob and they took him out and stoned him to death. Predictably, persecution then broke out in Jerusalem against the followers of Jesus. The apostles stayed in Jerusalem, but the other believers left and they scattered into the countryside. They made their way even into Samaria and preached the gospel there, winning converts for Jesus. Just before our story of Cornelius opens, Luke recounts that Peter had made his way around the countryside to these various groups of believers, and he was preaching and teaching and healing and even raising the dead. Then he went to the coast to a place called Joppa, and he was staying with a man called Simon the Tanner. The scene is now set for the Holy Spirit to set up Peter with a blind date, so to speak. So let's take some time to consider the two men in our story, Cornelius and Peter. Let's think about how they may have experienced events from their individual perspectives. We know what was going on, but they only knew their little piece of the story. And just as with the teachings of Jesus, we tried to forget that we knew about the events of Holy Week and the resurrection and just be like one of those hearing him for the first time and take his teachings for what they would have taken them as when they heard them. So let's forget 
that we know most Christians in the world today are not Jews. And Christianity has shaped the worldview of the West for centuries. And the gospel has made us what we are as a society today. But let's put ourselves back in that first century Palestine, about, 10 to, about, yeah, about five to 10 years after the events of that first Easter. The church is growing among the Jews in Jerusalem and it's even spread to the Samaritans. All the followers of Jesus are Jews. And as other Jews, they use the purity laws of the Torah to keep themselves from socializing with Gentiles. This was a long ingrained cultural habit. They were comfortable with it. They didn't think anything of it. It was just how things were. Jesus himself had said that he had come to the house of Israel. And in our gospel reading, when he sent out the disciples that first time to teach and heal, he told them to confine themselves to the people of Israel and not to go to Samaria or to the Gentiles. But then in his final commission to his apostles, Jesus told them to witness to him in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, but then he added, and to the ends of the earth. But habits are hard to break. These believers needed some help over the cultural barrier between Jews and Gentiles. And that's where this story comes into play. First, we are introduced to Cornelius. He's a Gentile. He's a Roman from Italy. He's a soldier, a centurion, who would have been in charge of about 100 soldiers in Caesarea, and this was the capital of the Romans in that area. He was probably a member of the governor's household guard. We are told he was a righteous man who feared the God of Israel. He prayed regularly and gave to the poor. Those are all Jewish religious practices. He had social standing in the city and a good reputation among his own people and amongst the Jews. I'm thinking maybe Cornelius felt somewhat out of place in his world. He was from what we would call a pagan nation, but he was part of its government and military machinery. He was a worshiper of the one true God, not the gods of the Romans. He had come to appreciate the religion of the Jews, but he hadn't gone so far as to convert to Judaism. So he wasn't really in sync with his own people and his own culture, but he wasn't a member of the Jewish community either. He was somewhere in between. We find him praying. This was three o'clock in the afternoon, which is one of the times of day that the Jews take time to pray. And Cornelius has a vision where an angel tells him that God has remembered him and has seen his good works. And he's instructed to send for Peter to come and to listen to what he has to say. So he does. He figures out the timing of, <clears throat> sorry, of the trip that his people would make and then Peter coming back. So that's Cornelius. Now we have Peter a Galilean Jew, a fisherman by trade, an apostle by calling, and a leader in the new church in Jerusalem. He's staying in the coastal town of Joppa. He's meditating on the roof, waiting for lunch. He also has a vision. He sees something like a sheet being let down from heaven, 
and it's full of all kinds of animals. And a voice tells him to get up, kill, and eat. Now, there were both clean and unclean animals in this sheet. The unclean animals are those that the law of Moses prohibited the Jews from eating. There were also clean animals in there that they could eat, but they would have been contaminated by their contact with the unclean animals. So according to the law, Peter couldn't eat any of these. So he's like, no way, never have I eaten something profane or unclean and I'm not gonna start now. And then the voice says, don't call profane something God has made clean. This happens three times. That is significant. In English, we can use the words like good, better, and best, superlatives. In Hebrew and Aramaic, they don't have those kinds of words. They would say, that's good. That's good, good, and that's good, good, good. That's how they would say, good, better, best. Say it once, say it twice, say it three times. Which is why in the Hebrew Bible, you see holy, 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 over, over, and over again. It means most holy or holiest. Because this vision came three times, it's a clue that this message is important. But Peter can't figure out exactly what it means and why he's having this vision now. And while he's thinking about it, the spirit tells him, oh yeah, by the way, there's, there's three guys waiting for you at the gate. They're looking for you. Go with them without hesitation. I've sent them. Why the command to go with them without hesitation? I thought about this a bit. I thought, first, one of these guys is a soldier. He would have been dressed as a Roman soldier. And you hear he's banging on the door asking for you and saying, yeah, come with me. <laughs> oh, yeah, right. <laughs> no problem. That could be scary. So the spirit is saying, without hesitation, go with them. It could have been because they were Gentiles. And again, there's this separation between the Jews and the Gentiles. And Peter wasn't accustomed to hanging around with Gentiles. But then Peter does something completely unexpected for a Jew. He invites these guys in and they have a meal and they stay overnight. It may have been easier for Peter to do this because his host, Simon, remember he's a tanner? This guy makes leather. You cannot make leather without touching dead animals. Like, hello, it's part of the job. So this guy would have been regularly, ritually unclean according to the Jewish law. But Peter's staying with him. And he doesn't seem to have a problem with that. So Peter's kind of got this sort of on again, off again kind of thing with ritual purity. He doesn't mind Simon so much, but whoa, I'm not eating that stuff. Maybe it was just food. But anyway, the next day, Peter leaves with the men from Cornelius, and he takes some of his own people with him. We find out later, he says, there were six Jewish believers that went with him. I wonder what Peter thought on the road to Caesarea. It would have taken them a day, day and a half to get there. They would have had to overnight on the road. So he had lots of time to think about, okay, this vision, what the heck does this mean? Maybe it's got something to do with these guys. Hmm, okay, what am I gonna say when I get there? I don't know, it's kind of interesting to imagine what he might have been thinking. Peter is met with a whole gathering of like-minded folks that are waiting expectantly to hear what he has to say. Almost his first words to the group are, well, you know, right, that it's unlawful for me to be here in your house with you? That was a bit of an exaggeration. The law didn't say, no, you can't go into a Gentile house. 
It meant, yeah, you might become ritually unclean if you touched something unclean, but you know, like you just wash and wait till evening and then you're good to go. It meant you can't go in the temple until you're clean again. Then Peter says, yeah, I got the message from the Spirit. I'm not to call people profane or unclean. He then says, all who fear God and do what is right are acceptable to God, no matter what their background is. That's a profound statement for a Jew of those days to make. They considered themselves the chosen people of God. Everybody else wasn't, and oh, so sad that you're not. But here he's saying, no, if you fear God and you do what's right, you're acceptable to God. Then he starts a summary of Jesus' teaching. And he's assuming that these folks in Caesarea would have heard some of what was happening in Galilee during Jesus' um, time on earth. And he says, you know that Jesus was anointed by God and that he went around the countryside healing people and preaching peace with God. Then he got them up to date on what happened in Jerusalem. Jesus was crucified, dead, buried, and then showed up alive again. And we are witnesses to that fact. And he's saying, we're commanded to preach Jesus as the one who will judge the living and the dead and as the one the prophets foretold would come and that all who believe in Jesus will receive forgiveness of sins in his name. This is the funny part. I think God has a sense of humor. Peter is still speaking when the Holy Spirit <laughs> falls on that group of Gentiles. Peter is actually interrupted, you know, mid-sentence by these people starting to speak in tongues and praise God. His Jewish companions are astounded, it says. Look, the Spirit is given even to the Gentiles. They were, yeah. Their, their socks were knocked off by this. And they couldn't deny it. The spirit was moving. It's like the spirit may have realized it would have been too much to expect Peter to lay hands on them and pray that they receive the Holy Spirit. It might not even have occurred to him to do that, given his Jewish mindset. But whatever the reason, the spirit upstages Peter and moves right from his sermon into the next step of the agenda. The spirit fills these Gentiles in the room. They're speaking in tongues. The Jews in the room are like, okay, this is different, didn't expect this. And Peter says to his buddies, how can we withhold baptism in water from these guys when they've received the spirit the same as we did at Pentecost? So he orders they be baptized in water and then he's asked to stay for several days, it says. I think he probably taught them more about Jesus' teaching and probably spent some time processing what the heck just happened here. This encounter between Peter and Cornelius, between the Jews and the Gentiles, had been planned and orchestrated by God. Each man had a vision. Angels were involved but each man also had their part to play. Each had been prepared by God for the next step in the expansion of the church into unexpected territory, but they needed to actually do something to make that come about. Peter and Cornelius wouldn't have had much in common. They wouldn't have had any reason to socialize. Their paths probably never would have crossed except for this encounter and accept for their faith in Jesus. The spirit lifted each above the barrier that divided their two peoples and brought Jew and Gentile together 
in faith in Jesus. And it was a significant moment in the kingdom of God. God's reconciliation was clearly now for all people, not just the chosen people, not just for the people of the Old Testament, for the Jews, but even for Gentiles. And on the same terms, they didn't have to convert and be Jews first. Salvation came through the Jews. Jesus was a Jew. But through the Jews and Jesus, all the nations on the, of the world would be blessed. Does it sound familiar? That promise had been given by God to Abraham 2,000 years before this time. And now it was being fulfilled right in front of Peter and Cornelius and their companions. This was the first step in getting the gospel out to the non-Jews of the world. And we're going to be following that in the next couple of weeks. But for today, what does this action of the Holy Spirit mean for us here, now, 21st century? What can we learn from the story of the Spirit bringing Peter and Cornelius together? Does God change his mind? God impassable? Jews were called to be distinct from the nations around them, and they had a whole bunch of rules about what that meant in their law. And then Jesus said he was sent to Israel, not to the Samaritans, not to the Gentiles. We read in our gospel reading when he sent out his disciples, he said, stick to the house of Israel. Don't go to Samaria. Don't go to the Gentiles. And then he turned it around after the resurrection and said, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to witness to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the rest of the world. What changed? I read a story about a mother and her daughter who were on opposite sides of a busy street. As the car sped by between them, the mother called out to her daughter, who wanted to join her on her side of the street, saying, just stay where you are, don't move. She knew that that child was safe on the far side of the street. Then, the cars were all stopped by a red light farther up the street. The road was clear, the mother calls to her daughter, okay, come across now, quickly come to me. So the daughter gets off the sidewalk and runs across the street to her mom. Did the mother change her mind? Hmm. Yes and no. It was the circumstances that had changed. What had been unsafe was now safe. Was the child confused by the change in her mother's instructions? I'm thinking little kids, probably not. Mom loves me, mom knows what she's doing. She's got my best interests at heart. Sure, she tells me not to move, I will move. Oh, now she's saying come, I'll come. Adults would think about it. What do you mean? You just told me, hey, what, what, the, what are you doing, right? And maybe miss the opportunity to cross the street. The light turns green and all the cars start again. If that kid had hesitated, she would have missed her chance. I use this to illustrate that there were reasons God had for keeping Israel separate from the neighboring nations. That difference was good and right for that time. But now, God was bringing the Gentiles together with the Jews to form a new people of God. Now was the time to cross the road, to overcome the social barriers, and to become one body of Christ in the world. What about us today? We have cultural norms, we have social habits, where we go, who we see, what we say. We even have religious traditions, pious practices, and spiritual disciplines. They're how we express our faith. They're how we hold to the faith. 
It's how we bring God into everyday life. Maybe I'm letting something out of the bag here, but we kind of joke with Alter Guild and communion assistants of, okay, like which candle do I light first? And which one is never supposed to be burning alone? And you're like, this is not in the Sermon on the Mount, people. <laughs> this is a pious practice that has developed over the years, and it's meant to mean something to us. But it's not a sin if you don't do it. Traditions and practices should be tools for our use, but they shouldn't be our masters. They help us grow in faith and love for God, but they're not hard and fast rules, and they're not sacred in and of themselves. They point to something greater. And they need to reflect the character of our God. And our God is loving, accepting, and generous. We can't use our traditions to exclude, reject, withhold, and judge. Oh, did you see what I did with the candles? I put the wrong one out first. So what? Like Peter, are we willing to hold our thoughts and our practices loosely enough that God can take them out of our hand when they're no longer useful? Can we handle it when God challenges our mainstream thinking and brings in something new? Can we handle it when God is speaking to someone else and bringing in something new? And we're going, you want a what? No, never been done. What if Peter had refused to adapt to the idea of Gentile followers of Jesus? We probably wouldn't be here. Actually, I'm thinking God would have found somebody else to do it, but. I ask myself, have I held back when God was calling me to move forward? Have I missed a chance to be led by the spirit of God into something new, something different, something he was working out? My advice to myself and to you is to be open to the leading of God's spirit. Be open to God doing a new thing, either through you or through a companion. And be open to, open to being a part of it. It may just be something small, but it might just be something that means the world to somebody else. Amen.